Good evening. I'm Maya Ojmera, President and CEO of the Society for Science and Executive Publisher of Science News. I am thrilled to bring you a conversation today between Dr. Leroy Hood and Science News Molecular Biology Senior Writer, Dr. Tina Hesman Say. The two will be discussing Dr. Hood's latest book, The Age of Scientific Wellness, which explores the cusp of major transformations in the healthcare system and how using information gleaned from our blood and genes and tapping into the data revolution, healthcare providers can catch the onset of disease years before symptoms arise. I'm confident that this is a conversation that you will find thought provoking. Dr. Hood is the CEO and founder of Phenome Health, a nonprofit organization developing a project called Human Phenome Initiative based on the science of wellness, which will sequence the genes and generate longitudinal data of 1 million people over 10 years. Dr. Hood has founded or co-founded 17 biotech companies, including Amgen, Applied Biosystems, Rosetta, and Arivel. His many national and international awards include the Lasker Prize, the Kyoto Prize, and the National Medal of Science. Currently, he is Chief Strategy Officer and Professor of the Institute of Systems Biology in Seattle. He's a member of all three academies, the National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Medicine, and he's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And I'm also proud to say that he was a finalist in the 1956 Science Talent Search, one of the society's world-class STEM competitions. Dr. Say is a geneticist turned science writer who covers all things microscopic. And as she says, a few things that are too big to be viewed under a microscope. She's an honors graduate of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where she did research on tobacco plants and ethanol-producing bacteria. She spent a year as a Fulbright Scholar in Germany and has a master's in science journalism from Boston University. Before joining Science News, she wrote for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch covering biotechnology, genetics, and medical science. Her work has been honored by the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, the Endocrine Society, the Genetic Society of, Amer of America, and by other journalism organizations. Please join me in welcoming Lee and Tina. Yes, thank you, Maya. Those great introductions. Um, Dr. Hood, I think we'll get started here because I'm excited to talk with you about your book called The Age of Scientific Wellness. Um, and I wanted to ask you right off the bat, what is wellness? You write in the book that it's not simply the absence of disease. So how do you define what wellness actually is? Well, I think one of the big transformations in healthcare is going to be coming with the emergence of data-driven health. And it's big data-driven health. It's looking at the genome and the phenome, and we'll define those things in a little more detail later on. But the idea is we can assess the trajectory of an individual's health. And from that data-driven assessment, we can move the individual back more toward homeostasis, which means we can increase their wellness and we can give them the information they need to avoid disease. So in my view, wellness is not just what you are now if you aren't sick. It's the realization that most people probably represent uh, 20 to 30% of their potential wellness. And with this science-driven approach, we can use the actionable possibilities that emerge from the data to either improve wellness or avoid disease. Do you use a, a figure that, that shows how people may experience um, wellness for a good portion of their life, especially when they're young? and then you transition into some disease states, like some people may develop diabetes or others may develop cancer. Um, 
And you are saying that if we can catch it at those transition points, we can move people backwards. Is that going to actually make people live longer? Is what you're proposing an anti-aging approach? Let me say a word or two about the term health, because I think there's misunderstanding about just what health means. First, I would argue that health enables and enriches every single fundamental human trait, your development, your education, the jobs that you carry out, the your ability to interact with individuals, your creativity, your passion, your, your enjoyment of life, and it enormously enhances your health span. So health span is the idea of how long are you going to live, but in a healthy mode where you're mentally alert, physically capable, and all of the rest. But the really important point is, as we make our health span equal our lifespan, and as we embody scientific wellness, and as we'll discuss later, the ability to age in a much more healthy fashion, and as you predicted, the ability to predict disease years before it actually clinically manifests itself, my argument is that's going to extend your health span out into the 90s or even into the hundreds. And it's going to give you an extra 20 or 30 years of healthy life. And the fascinating question is, what are you going to do with that extra 20 or 30 years? I'm sure many people would soon bore playing tennis and golf and things like that. And you have a chance to be creative and passionate and have a mission in those last 30 years. And I rank myself in that yeah, age group now since I'm just short of 85 right now. And the Phenome Project that we'll talk about is probably a 15-year initiative at the minimum. And I plan to be here for the end of that. Excellent. Well, do you think that increasing health span will also increase lifespan? I think increasing health span uh, uh, definitely will increase lifespan. And the question is, is it just going to be incremental as we figure out a lot of the complexities of systems failures that happen at the end of your life? Or will there be some dramatic improvements in lifespan? My own feeling about it is it's going to be incremental, but my own feeling is with the things that we'll come to learn over the next 50 years or so, we could well be extending our lifespan and our health span out to 150 or more. Wow. Uh, one of the registrants here uh, said that they considered that they didn't become middle-aged until they turn 75 because they plan to live to 147. So that's right on your target prediction. Well, it's my target prediction. I don't know if we have all the tools in the, the wellness and prevention armamentarium to get that far, but I certainly wish them a lot of luck and I'd love to be just behind. <laughs> all right. So, um, the approach that you talk about in the book, it you call P4 medicine. And those four Ps are predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. So of those four Ps, which do you think is going to be the hardest to achieve? Because for me, I think the participatory portion might be simultaneously one of the easier things and one of the harder things to achieve. Uh, easy because, you know, people have their cell phones, their Fitbits, their smartwatches, and 
lots of other devices that we carry with us that are already able to measure things like our heart rate and our sleep and all sorts of health measures. So from that standpoint, it seems like it would be easy to get that information. But the hard part for me seems to be, you know, how do you get people who aren't sick to think, oh, I really need to go to the doctor and, you know, get my blood drawn several times a year or have some other types of tests and measurements done. I mean, people don't like to do that even when they are having problems. Well, let me say a word or two about uh, P4 medicine. That term actually arose in the early 2000s when I was kind of applying uh, global holistic systems thinking to the whole question of what healthcare should be. And we, I came to the conclusion of the four Ps, prediction, prevention, personalization, and participatory. The really important point is the first of those three Ps all entail science. They are what we have to do to get where we want to go. Prediction, prevention, participation at the individual level, those are all critical things. And, and fundamentally, we really know how to approach them and how to attack them. I think the fourth P is absolutely the hardest. Because if you think about it, the fourth P doesn't just include individuals who want to practice wellness. It's the patients, it's the physicians, it's the healthcare leaders, it's the leaders of healthcare companies and so forth, it's the regulators, it's the politicians that will have to play a role in these things. And, you know, my experience in being a participant in a whole series of paradigm changes that took us to where we are today is people and scientists included are particularly conservative and reluctant to take on new things unless you somehow convince them. But the real heart of the convincing is education. So for the fourth P, we've really started to focus education at the uh, K through 12 level. And in fact, we've just finished at ISB uh, with the education group we have here. And it's a marvelous group of about 12 or 15 people that really in the past anyway had concentrated on K through 12 education. They took a book we'll be publishing recently on systems biology and systems medicine and use the two systems medicine chapters to create a full year, four module course on what the essence of P4 medicine is going to have to be in the future. We did this with teachers. They helped in the writing of the curriculum and with students as well. And we're just beginning to test it this first year. And it's the idea that we can send this curriculum out to all of you and you can use it and uh, participate in, in it. But what I'll guarantee is the students who graduate after a year-long course uh, in, in this P4 medicine, if you will, will probably know more about the future of medicine than 95% of the doctors that are out there today. So I think education is very, very important. Now, a second thing we've done that could be a resource for your teacher is uh, Google and I persuaded Scientific American to make an 80-page insert on the new science of uh, wellness uh, and prevention. And the exciting thing about this is they are articles written by leaders in this area. And they're written in the very simple language that ordinary people can understand them, very well illustrated. So this 80-page uh, document gives you a wonderful understanding of where healthcare is going to go in the future and how we're going to make a dramatic shift from 
a healthcare today that's almost entirely disease oriented to one in the not too distant future that's going to be wellness and prevention oriented. Um, so what you are proposing seems like a, a radical departure from how medicine is practiced today. Uh, and uh, well, I would argue that data-driven health is the most radical departure in all of health ever. Well, I mean, one of the things is one person pointed out, um, they said, if diseases were all curable, the economic effects and affects would decimate the economy. Healthcare, insurance, life insurance, and research make up at least 30% of our economy. So well, how do you get what? all those people who have a vested interest in making money off of chronic disease and treating disease? How do you get them to embrace a wellness first model? You know, isn't it ironic that our higher health care system essentially makes its money entirely on sick people? It has no incentive to make you well or to really help with preventing disease. So let me make that point really clear. And I think that decimation of the economy argument is utter nonsense because I think what are going to happen is the payers, the insurance companies, as well as the providers are going to realize there are enormous economic opportunities in wellness and prevention. And we're not suddenly going to cure all diseases. That's going to be a large transitional period that will give the payers and the providers the opportunity they have to refashion the opportunities that will come out of wellness and prevention. And wouldn't it be marvelous to think that much of the money is going into wellness and prevention rather than into disease? And I'll make the argument that every healthcare, uh, 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 every healthcare community in the world today, country in the world today, is going to be economically unstable because the entire focus on disease is at a late stage of disease. And most of the drugs that come out treat symptoms. They don't treat fundamental causes. The only place you can treat fundamental causes efficiently is to catch it very early. So I'll just argue that there will be a transition period. And in fact, I think the healthcare systems that are best positioned to be able to adapt to this new kind of healthcare wellness and prevention are those who have an integrated payer function and a provider function. So they have a hospital function and an insurance function together. And we're talking with a number of healthcare systems in that arena. And there's at least one that is incredibly excited about collaborating with us to show that this new approach of wellness and prevention can be economically beneficial, but to do it in a graded manner so appropriate accommodations can be made. But the really important point is what 30% of the economy focused on disease stresses is we're spending our dollars in the wrong place completely. We wanna make people healthy We don't want to only deal with disease. We want to have healthiness be a motivation, economic and psychological for companies and not have only disease be that motivation. Right. Uh, You describe in the book um, that medical education underwent a big revolution after um, a report by someone named Flexner. And uh, many medical schools were shut down after his report. Um, do you envision that moving to this this data driven wellness approach is going to cause major upheaval at the medical school level? Will we have to shutter our medical schools and start over from scratch? 
No, I think it'll be an incremental kind of thing in just the way I've described for the uh, economic side of things. I will say that medical schools have really prescribed rituals in how they teach students, and they're very rigid about changing these rituals. And in my explorations with several good medical schools, in, including my alma mater, Johns Hopkins, I found very little interest in making the kinds of educational changes that will be necessary to enable both systems thinking on the one hand and uh, the wellness of individuals, something I call uh, individual population health on the other hand. But that is going to be done in some medical schools. And I think the most attractive ones to start with are those organizations that are starting new medical schools. But, you know, there is a chicken and an egg here because there are regulations and rules that govern what medical students have to be taught. So we have to change those that are making the regulations as well as those that are teaching what is professed to be regulated. So it's a very complex uh, economic, educational, experimental research system. And we'll have to make incremental but significant changes that will be done so in a fashion that can be accommodated by the current status quo. Yeah, so, I mean, those are, are huge systemic changes that need to be made. Let's talk about the science. So you're saying that you need at least three types of information in order to to do this this wellness based approach, and you're starting with um, genetic information. Um, you know we've been we've completed the human genome years ago, and now we have what's called the human pan genome, which is uh, a, a more complete picture of human genetic diversity that's still mm -hmm. being added to. Sure. So for for each person. Um, are they going to have to, you know, get their DNA sequenced at birth? And what can that alone tell us? Is, is that going to be enough information by itself? You know, it isn't enough information. There are, there are two kinds of information. There's your genome, okay? That's the sequence of the 23 pairs of chromosomes that exist in uh, every one of your cells. And then there's your phenome, which is essentially all the other information that impinges on your body and, and the genome. And a really good analogy is the following. When a writer of music writes out the song, it's a digital representation of music, right? When the performer plays the song, he adds his passion or her passion and excitement and enthusiasm and interpretation and modifies it in many ways. Your genome essentially sets the framework for how you're going to develop to be a human being, but your behavior and your environment modulate that genome and do so in different ways for each of us. So that at any point in your lifetime, your phenome, your appearance at that time, is the integration of your genome, your behavior, and your environment. And what data-driven health attempts to do is understand how your behavior and how your environment modify the potential your genome has given you. Let me just say, in the genome, there are variants that cause many actionable possibilities that we could talk about. For example, the American College of Medical Genetics has defined about 80 variant genes where they argue there are actionable things you can do to improve the health of individuals that have those variants. And to give you an example, 
there is a disease called malignant hypothermia. It's a variant that if you have it and in surgery take the wrong anesthetic, that activates your heating system irreversibly and it kills you. So if you know you have that variant, you stay away from the anesthetics that will lead to that end cause. It's a simple, simple kind of uh, trivial remedy. And, and so for the other 80 or so variants. So you ought to know about those. A second set of variants cause your body to be able, not to be able to re respond effectively to given drugs. So you metabolize them too fast or too slow, and either way, they don't work for you. And there are probably a uh, hundred such drugs that have genetic variants that the people who express them will not use those drugs effectively. And in some time, some cases, they can cause really deleterious effects. And so the drugs, the, the variants that cause abnormal reactions to drugs, those are another set of things called pharmacogenomics that variants that uh, should be known. But it goes on and on. I mean, there, may, for example, there are of the order of six or 700 personal variants that have to do with athletic injuries. I mean, some people have variants that will give you an ACL tear very easily. Yet, if you know you have the variant, you can do exercises that can avoid that. So anybody interested in athletics ought to know the hundreds of variants that have these kinds of effects. And so the genome has many variants now that if identified uh, can be lead to remedies for the deleterious causes they, they affect. Right, so, so the second um, type of information that, that you- So the are... second type of information we measure now in three major ways. One, we can look at proteins and metabolites and clinical chemistries in the blood and quantify them. And they give us enormous insights into other actionable possibilities. And I'll mention one in just a moment. But the other is that we analyze the gut microbiome, which is this sheath of microbes that separate the contents of your stomach. So it's your food and the drugs you take orally from entry into the blood. And they modify both of those things in major ways. And then finally, we can make measurements with digital health devices like Fitbit and Aura Rings that measure the physiology of the individual, how many steps you've walked, how much altitude you've gained, how well you've slept, uh, and so forth. So th it's these three classes of information that we can integrate together on the phenome side that give you exponentially more uh, actionable possibilities than even the genome does in some ways. And we're actually proposing for the future a second genome-like project, which we call the International Phenome Project, where we propose a million people will be analyzed with genome and phenome analyses over a 10-year period. And in that time, it'll do two things. One, it'll absolutely prove an enormous increase in quality of your health care, of your wellness and prevention. And two, it'll demonstrate explicitly the enormous savings that are going to come from uh, practicing wellness and prevention medicine. And I'll give you one example in that regard. Our, our, the cost for healthcare in, in 22 was approximately $4.4 trillion. We spent 86% of that money on chronic diseases. 
diabetes, uh, heart disease, um, Alzheimer's, uh, and the like. What if by this early detection and prevention within a 10 to 15 year period, we could eliminate 50% of the chronic disease? That would be um, a savings of multiple trillions of dollars. So those are the kind of savings we'd be looking about. And that money then could be directed in other uh, areas toward wellness and prevention, because there are many things we could do there to expand the opportunities there. Not the least of which is making sure we understand in context of racial diversity, the differences that will exist between Caucasians and Blacks and Latinos and so forth. That's a critical thing that's largely failing in medicine today. And, and, and so forth. So there are many things we can do, but I think this million person project will give us the hard concrete evidence we need to say, we're gonna transform the quality and we're gonna transform the cost of healthcare. And it will also develop technologies like the digital technologies so that we can take the enormous numbers of measurements we make today and reduce them to a much more effective, manageable number and develop devices like the tricorder that'll work at home. So in 15 years, I predict most people will generate their own data at home, will send it to a data analytics center, and that in turn will use AI to send to the physicians and the patients the results of that data-driven analysis that you, you carried out at home. So there's going to be a striking migration of healthcare in the future from the hospital system to the home system. And that's going to have enormous consequences financially for all sorts of services, but it's going to create enormous opportunities for improving the human condition. That brings me to... AI, uh, because as you are talking about, you are going to be making, I, I don't know how many different measurements you would be making of each person in the Phenome Project. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then how are you going to be using AI to help you make sense of that? Well, I'll tell you, for the genome alone, we're going to make 6 billion measurements, okay? That's the haploid genome, your mother's and your father's uh, taken together. And for the phenomes, um, how do you count the number of measurements you make with digital instruments, for example? I mean, it, it, it's, uh, I guess you can look at the digital information you produce for these instruments, but it's a staggering amount of information, much greater than even is going to be present in the genome. So it means we have to be able to handle this information and really reduce its dimensionality down to metadata that integrate together whole sets of information that at a high level can tell you something and a measurement that we've already uh, achieved for this is your biological age. We were able in a population of 5,000 people we looked at for a four year period to, sh and they ranged in age from 21 to uh, 93, to essentially show these individuals as they age, lost control of their ability to express the three major classes of analytes in the blood clinical chemistries, proteins, and metabolites. And what we were able to derive from that observation was an algorithm that allowed us for each individual to determine their biological age. So this is the age your body says you are, as opposed to the age your birthday says you are. And the further your biological age is below your birthday age, the better you're going to be uh, aging. And we showed in this wellness program with the 5,000 individuals 
that for women, every year they stayed in the program, they lost uh, a year and a half of biological age. And for men, it was 0.8 years. And the difference probably had to do with compliance, although we're not completely certain. But the important conclusion that came from that is wellness gives us the tools to diminish the rate at which we age. And in diminishing the rate at which we age, we diminish enormously the rate at which we move into chronic diseases. And the question in the future is, can we diminish the aging rate and combine it with scientific wellness to the point, essentially, people in the future will never get chronic diseases, especially if we have the ability to detect them early and then reverse them at an early stage. So these are the kind of exciting metrics that come. But that aging metric uses quantitation that comes from every single organ in the body, and it kind of it assesses globally then what your biological age is. So it's remarkable compressions of data like this that we'll be able to get from the million person project and reduce enormously the data dimensionality. And for many of these high level information features, maybe we'll be able to devise simple digital instruments that can measure these things outside the body. And this is a very exciting area of research uh, today. Well, uh, specifically on the on the AI front, with, with AI helping you uh, keep track of all of these things and spot those patterns, uh, calculate your biological age. Um, people are very interested in AI. We got lots of questions about the, that, and um, there, there tend to be some themes. Um, one person asked, will doctors become unnecessary with AI except possibly for surgeons? And will personalized care disappear? While other people asked whether AI can be used to promote equity in healthcare and whether it's going to be available globally. And one person asked about how much government oversight is going to be needed to keep AI safe for people. Well, you asked me about five or six different questions there. So uh, if if I miss some, uh, uh, you can prompt me. Let, let's talk about the question of equity. I think uh, equity with regard to racial diversity and so forth uh, is a reality of today's medicine. But the major reason I think that inequity exists is because data has not been generated in the genome phenome form in all the different uh, uh, races in, in equal proportion because your genetics can enormously change how we should treat you for certain kinds of diseases. There's no question about that. So a part of the Million Genome Project is a commitment to doing the genome phenome analyses on individuals that reflect the racial balance we have in the US and to make sure we have all of the minorities represented in, in that information. So I, I think that's one answer to the question. But let me give you a high level answer to what I think AI is, is going to do. I think AI, I think we're going to be able to take the most powerful current form of AI, which is large language modules, and this is GPT-4 and things like that, which has been trained to respond to questions, languages, and so forth, and we'll be able to use it to very powerfully deal with complexity. Now, the challenge with these large language systems is what they give you back is reflected by how you train them. So if you let a large language system go out into the internet 
and look at everything out there, you're going to get duplicity and terrorism and false claims and all sorts of things. So what we're planning to do is use a large language model system that has been only trained on medical data. And I think that's really important. And we're uh, interacting with Google now on the possibility of doing that with one of their large language models. And the idea we have is that there are other AI tools we can use to train very effectively uh, the large language model. So it will have the sum total of biological and medical knowledge. And we're going to do that by taking uh, knowledge graphs, which are essentially collections of information from the literature that do correlations between genes and proteins and diseases and uh, symptoms and all of these kinds of things and, and relate them one to another. And we'll be using a large knowledge graph from uh, Google, for example, that has 50 million nodes and 850 million edges. So it means there's an enormous amount of information that has been correlated. And we'll put that into this large language model. We're now making a number of digital twins, one for Alzheimer's, one for diabetes, and we're just starting to think about how to do one for wellness. All of these will also be fed into the large twin. And together with all the information in the published literature called PubMed, okay? So it will be an enormous assemblage of information this large language model has. And the idea is then we can take the very complex data from one individual and to feed it into the large language model, and we can assess the deficiencies and the distance from normal, healthy, optimized equilibria. And what it will do is be able to feed out for each individual a prioritized list of actionable possibilities that if the individual does them, will improve wellness or let them avoid disease. And it AI will then be used to send it to their physician, explaining both what the actionable possibility is and what the patient has to do. And at the same time for each actionable possibility, providing the clinical evidence that validates this as a true and objective initiative. And the exciting idea is then, I think family practitioners are going to be the future of this transition in healthcare. And what this AI will do, and I think the million person project is going to generate easily 10,000 or more of these new actionable possibilities. But imagine how they could make each practitioner a domain expert in virtually every single disease because he'd have it right at his beck and hand as he had to de deal with the actionable possibilities for heart disease and diabetes and on and on and on and wellness, of course, too. So I think, I think AI is going to be one of the transformative ages in uh, tools in in making this new shift to uh, wellness and prevention of anything going on. And my feeling is that medicine is in part an art and the psychological ability to communicate with people and the need for doctors and their assistance is never going to be lost. Well, can we talk about what goes into what you're feeding the the AI? Uh, for instance, you talk about in the book um, that you think Alzheimer's disease is not the result of the plaques that uh, build up um, these 
amyloid beta plaques that build up. Right. Um, right. But, you know, there's a, all this uh, literature out there, scientific literature in PubMed that says the opposite of what you are saying. So how does the AI judge what's the real case? Is it going to go off of, you know, those many decades of, of uh, A beta literature? Or is it going to go with, um, you know, what the Phenome Project might be telling it? Well, you know, it's a lot like the analogy of the lemurs that lead one another off the cliff. I think physicians for the last 20 years, 15 years, have been hypnotized by amyloid and tau and have argued that an entity that is a response to the disease rather than the cause of the disease is actually the cause. And, you know, the best evidence for this is in the last 14 years, there have been almost 600 clinical trials and they each cost a billion to today, two and a half billion dollars a, a piece. And until very recently, and almost all of them were aimed at beta amyloid, none of them worked. And I would say zero for 600 is pretty strong evidence that you've really got the wrong hypothesis going. Now, there have been some recent very marginal tests that say there can be a little change for a short period of time, but really none of those drugs, I think, is going to be the answer to Alzheimer's. And in the end, the answer to Alzheimer's isn't what... Uh, uh, to wait until you get the disease and try and fix the loss of neurons, you're never going to fix those. It's to predict the disease beforehand or to detect it very early and reverse it there. It's actually exactly what I said when I was talking with chronic diseases. We now have um, a digital twin that we've been working with collaborators on for the last two or three years. And at a very high level, what the digital twin has demonstrated unequivocally is the things that make the biggest difference in preventing Alzheimer's are things like proper diet, proper exercise, and, 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 uh, and the ability to recognize when changes are occurring in you that are the very earliest stage of this disease. So we can do something about it. And there are very effective preventive modes that one can use to start thinking about uh, avoiding diseases like Alzheimer's, even if you have the genetic propensity like a uh, APOE4 gene, which is the strongest indicator of uh, Alzheimer's disease. There are ways you can avoid the consequences of that gene. Can we uh, back up a bit uh, when you were talking about equity and especially um, racial equity? Uh, there are some groups who uh, have elected not to participate in genetic research. And uh, for instance, many uh, Native American nations have decided not to participate in genetics research because of past abuses from the scientific community. Um, and if they are going to participate in genetics, they want it to be people in their own community who are doing the work to benefit that community. There are, there are other people who just simply don't want the government or any outside entity to have their DNA. So how can you respect the sovereignty, autonomy, and privacy of people who don't want to share their genetic information, but still allow them to benefit from the advances that you are going to be making with the wellness approach? Well, let me just say I'm sympathetic to all of the concerns they express. I mean, I think they're real. I think they have to be dealt with in a straightforward and effective way. And I think what's critical is, is education. That is to understand the way, to understand what DNA is and what it can do 
and the ways it's going to be used and how it can be um, used in a way that's perfectly safe to you. And for example, with the 5,000 people we talked about, we actually de-identified DNA from the individuals. So we analyzed the DNA collectively, not knowing uh, basically who it was uh, associated with for most of the studies. So, and there are very good computational techniques that can assure that you can you can de-identify the DNA. Um, I think the, the biggest issue that is is a real issue still is discrimination. And of course, there are a lot of people that really talk down the, the concern of discrimination. I think unequivocally, we need laws for all of our types of insurance that prevent any insurance company, any employer, or in fact, anybody the individual wishes not to uh, have access to the results of their DNA uh, to be able to avoid it. We have partial laws with health insurance with a law called GINA and, and Obamacare, uh, but those aren't sufficient. Long-term health insurance is a critical thing everybody should have as they get older, and this isn't protected. So I think discrimination is a big problem that we have yet to work on. But I, I think we can carry out these uh, analyses in a way that is that protects the individual in whatever way they want. And of course, ultimately, in the end, the individual does have the right to say, no, I, I don't want to do this. Now, you can't both say, no, I don't want to have to do this, and at the same time, get the benefits. I mean, it, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And that's why I think the education is really important. And I think for the past um, misuse of people, and that's really a good term, I think the individual should understand the process by which the DNA is being extracted and studied and feel comfortable that that protects their rights in an appropriate way. And if it doesn't, you just say, I refuse to do it. I'll tell you what really convinced people to agree to these kind of studies in, in the program with the 5,000 individuals was the argument that the studies we're making on your DNA and your phenome, we did both in this, are going to transform healthcare in the future, and they're going to give your kids and your grandkids a much better health care. And that's absolutely true. Well, speaking of that, those future generations seem like they may well live long, well lives thanks to what you're trying to do. But what about those of us who are probably already on our way to disease and don't even know it? Can we still reverse those transitions? And, and what, what do you have for us? Uh, look, I'm one of us, right? <laughs> one of the older people. I would say at any point in your life, you can benefit from the kind of data-driven health that I'm talking about. You can ensure that any transitions that you haven't made uh, can be identified in the future. And, and, you know, we can't reverse them now, but we will be able to in the future. You could start at any time and do dramatic things to change the rate at which you age and so forth. So I think at at any point in this health span from uh, early uh, and 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 uh, youngsters and so forth, all the way up to the oldest individuals, there's always room to optimize your health and avoid things that can still be in the future for you. What's your number one tip for for what people should be doing now? Well, I, I think the number one tip is to realize that your future is in your own hands. 
And that should oblige you to learn about what the options for that health future are, and then make choices and decisions about them, and not make the choices and decisions through ignorance, okay? And that's why I think the book is very useful in laying out these principles. I think the Scientific American article that I talked about is marvelous for talking about uh, scientific wellness and things like that. But I think the most important thing I can say is what is really important is you take responsibility for your health. If you ask me what I think are the most important things in my health, and I'll tell you that I'm more than 15 years younger than my chronologic age. So I'm I'm a youngster. I'm only in my 70s now, in my at 70. Uh, I would say I, I, I was an athlete in high school and college. I played football. I've exercised my entire life, and I've really made it a part of my life. I do it every day. I spend 40 minutes. And I think that exercise and, you know, intense, vigorous exercise and balancing and stretching and all of those things, I think, are critically important. Yoga is a terrific thing to practice uh, in this regard. Uh, so I think exercise is one. I think diet is really important. I, as you look around most Americans, most people have an extra 10 to 15 to 50 pounds, and getting rid of that extra weight makes an enormous difference in how you feel. Actually, in my uh, 70s, early 70s, I ballooned up to about 195. And one of the things that made a difference was, you know, a diet with all the things we hear about, vegetables and fruit, no little red meat and uh, fish and things like that. I eat that kind of a diet. But I, I do pretty regular intermittent fasting. So this is the idea. You eat dinner at six o'clock and then you don't eat again until lunch or even again until dinner the next day. And you find you can lose weight beautifully with no special exertion. You want to make sure your one major meal has all the things you need and everything. And I would say third, your blood, uh, your clinical chemistries and things like that have enormous things that tell you about the balance of your vitamins and minerals and all the things like that. And I think having that analysis and balancing things out, I think those are things that have really made a difference for me. And, you know, I'm optimistic that I'd, I'd like to see if I can get my biological age down even further than it is now. But, you know, we don't know anything about how far you can you can really push things down. So well, I, I wish you the best of luck with that. And we are uh, coming up on our our time. But did you have any last thoughts that you want to share with? Well, I think the, the, the thought I just ended with is one I'll really emphasize. Look, your future health is in your own hands. So get educated and do something about optimizing it. Thank you, Dr. Hood. This was a really great conversation. Appreciate your time and your thoughts. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>